Today I'm speaking with Brent Johnson. Uh, Brent's the founder and the CEO of Santiago Capital. He's a keynote speaker at the symposium, Gold, the Gold Investment Symposium, which is taking place in Sydney on the 8th and 9th of October. Welcome to the series, Brent. Nice to have you with us. Thank you. I'm excited to, to be with you today. Now, you're talking, uh, when you come down to Sydney, about the implications of a flawed monetary system. What do you mean by the flawed monetary system? Well, I guess what I mean is if you, if you were to look at the monetary system as an engineer would, and you, you realize how it actually works, and you start to question how it works, you, 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 you'll start to realize there are flaws in the way it's designed. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's going to crash tomorrow. It doesn't mean that it's going to crash next week. But it means that it's, a, it, it's an inherently unstable system. And if you were designing a car or you were designing a plane or if you were designing something else like that, as an engineer would and would be looking for you know, flaws to keep things from crashing, so to speak, you would never design that car, that submarine, that plane the way that you've designed the monetary system. And, uh, you know, I learned about it when I was in college and I never just questioned it. I never questioned it. I just, that's the way it is. Um, but once I started questioning and digging deeper, um, that's, when, that's when it became clear to me. And I think that's interesting that you never question it when you're in college. And I think that's that's what, you know, we have a big global economy. Uh, people have jobs. The average investor is going about their lives. They've got mortgages and children. And, and they don't question the system because the system is what it is. What is this change that you see? How does that, what's that going to mean for the world economy? Well, you know, I, I don't like to be a doom and gloomer. I don't like great, to, you know, great. I'm, I'm actually a really happy guy. Um, pe people a lot of time will essentially assume that I'm this pessimist who just, you know, running around saying the sky is falling. I'm actually a really positive guy. I'm a really happy guy. I, I, I don't walk around with a cloud over my head. But that said, I, I think we have some serious days ahead of us. And um, I, I think that, you know, investors, big and small, um, need to at least realize that it could happen. And in my opinion, it will happen. And I, I don't want it to happen. I would love to be wrong. But when I look at the policies that are in place and the fact that most people don't even admit there is a problem and just continuing to do the, the things that I feel have gotten us into the problem to begin with, I, I don't see much, uh, much other way out of it, to be honest. When you say, when you look at the policies that are in place, are you talking from a U.S. policy perspective or a global policy perspective? Well, it's, it's really a global policy perspective. I mean, it's driven by the United States. Um, you know, some people have a very positive opinion of the United States. Some people have a very negative opinion of the United States. And I, I think regardless of whether you think that's good or bad, it, it is a fact that, that the U.S. is, is a world leader. And, uh, you know, um, in many ways, for better or for worse, many countries around the world follow our lead. Um, so it's not just the Federal Reserve and the U.S. government. It's the Bank of England and the U.K. government, and it's the Australian government and the U. You know, the Australian Central Bank and the Japanese Central Bank. Many of these uh, these institutions uh, subscribe to the same philosophy. They they work together in some ways. They they meet you know on a regular basis to coordinate policy. So I, I really do think it's a, it's a global phenomenon, and that's really kind of what's scary. Is I think you know I'm. I'm in my young 40s, so it's not like I've been around for three or four hundred years. But you know, the history that I read, uh, it, you know, it's the first time in history that there has been such a coordinated policy worldwide where everybody's doing the same thing. Uh, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, there was probably some part of the world that wasn't doing the same thing. And if you didn't like what was going on or the policies that were being implemented, you could go to that other place, or capital could flow to where it was freer, I guess, if that's the right way to say it. Uh, but that's really tough to do today because everything is so coordinated. The world is so small now that uh, uh, there's really not uh, a place where you can escape, so to speak. Well, there isn't a place that you can escape, but what does this mean for the average investor? You know, the guy on the street that uh, really isn't that well educated into global monetary systems and just wants to be able to, you know, how do they look after themselves? Well, I think it's a few things. I think 
some so some people are just not naturally inclined to study finance or have an interest in you know doing a bunch of research on mutual funds and how they should invest their IRA. And, and I get that. And you know, truth be told, it's not my favorite thing to do in the world either. Read read the financial pages on the weekend, but I do enjoy it. But it's not my favorite thing to do. And I can understand where some people it'll put them to sleep. And even if it didn't put them to sleep, perhaps they don't have the education, the training, or the the skill set to take in what they're reading and then apply it to their daily lives anyway. But considering the implications of not doing so, I think people need to take a more active role in their investments than perhaps they currently do. I think at least here in the U.S., you know, it's very common for people just to put money away every month into their 401k. And that's not necessarily a bad idea. You should pay yourself before you pay your taxes and you pay you know, for, for uh, trivial things. And so, so having some capital saved up is a great thing. But to just blindly do it and not really understand the implications of doing so, I think is also a little bit uh, naive. And unfortunately, I think it can hurt people. Um, so while I think the, the, the theory is, is good in, in principle, um, I, I think even if it's not your favorite thing to do, I think you really need to take a good hard look at, uh, at, at your investments, at your 401ks, at your IRA, so your pension plans, or your, your what, what, or whatever your form of saving is and how it's allocated, I think you really need to, to, to take a look at it because I don't think that the next 20 or 30 years will play out the same way the last 20 or 30 years did. And so let's move into that sort of that gold space uh, that which you know we are talking about the gold investment symposium. So Santiago Capital, based in San Francisco, you have a number of clients. What's your strategy uh, in this current system for your clients? Sure. Well, um, I guess first of all, I, I, I've been managing portfolios uh, for high net worth clients for about fifteen or sixteen years now, and for several years. It did not include a uh, precious metals uh, component. Um, kind of in the 2006, 2007 time frame, it started to become more uh, a bigger part. And then, in, you know, 2008 and subsequent to 2008, it became an even more important part. And, and as the more I, I, I researched it, and the more I, you know, studied the economy, and the more I tried to figure out how we were going to, um, you know continue to protect client capital and make them money in the years ahead, the more I got into the precious metal space. And um, so, so our, and, and because I, because I think, uh, you know, that the, that the monetary system is in trouble, um, I guess to put it bluntly, um, I didn't think that the traditional precious metals solutions that were out there were appropriate for, for the clients that I have. Uh, you know, I, I did a big uh, investment manager search. I talked to a number of different managers. I've talked to a number of different funds. And whenever I, it always seemed like there was something lacking or something that I think needed to, to, to be added or subtracted from the current managers that I talked to. And that's not that they weren't smart people. And it's not that I didn't think that they were capable. Uh, but I just always think that I always just thought there needed to be something different. And, you know, as I went along that process, I, I just kind of decided, well, if nobody else is doing it and I think it needs to be done, why don't I just do it myself? So then I, I went on a, you know, a kind of a big trip around the world, really. I went to you know, Los Angeles and New York and London and Switzerland and Singapore, and I spoke to a number of different uh, you know, veterans and industry um, players and you know, uh, precious metals analysts, precious metals traders, vaulting um, companies, um, you know, uh, the um, the different assayers and, and, and you know because I, I really wanted to try to understand it all and when I came back from that trip I realized that I could actually set it up the way that I thought it needed to be set up and then I could allocate my clients uh, allocation to precious metals into this fund and that that was really the genesis of Santiago. So so in terms of allocation of your of your clients funds if we go back to the sort of um, a few years ago um, well, it wasn't yeah. that long ago, and gold took up to the heady heights of 1900, and now it's 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 sort of tracking sideways as sort of the 12 to 1300 range. How do your clients feel about that, or are you confident that it's uh, it's going to um, be more stable in the future? Sure, sure. Well, first of all, I guess I would say obviously nobody likes it when their investment goes down. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter if it goes down one percent or if it goes down. 70%. Nobody likes it. 
But I think if and, so, and I think if you're a precious metals manager who in 2011 or 2012 told your clients to put all your money in here because we're going to make you know millions of dollars and we're all going to be playing in private jets, then you know you have uh, have not succeeded in that endeavor and you're you're probably not a very happy person right now. But if you have precious metals as a portion of a diversified portfolio, and if you went into it knowing that this is your insurance policy rather than your get rich quick scheme, and you knew it was more of a long term play rather than over the next six months, then I don't really think anything has changed. It's frustrating. I'm not going to sit here and say it hasn't been frustrating to see gold pulled back these years. Um, but I, I think when you're an investment, professional, you have to understand that that could happen. And so I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat lucky in that I think when I, when I explained to clients why they needed to have this portion of their portfolio, I explained it in the right way. I hope I did at least. And I didn't say put all your money into this. Uh, it, it, it's a, it's a, I, I, think it hap I happen to think it's the most important part of the portfolio, uh, but it's not the only part of the portfolio and it's not necessarily the biggest part of the portfolio. For me, myself personally, it is the biggest part of the portfolio. Uh, but for my clients, their average allocation to precious metals is, you know, I think the anywhere between 10 and 20 percent. And there's a few on the lower end, and there's a few on the higher end. But I think most of them probably fall in there somewhere. And so when you consider that the other, what is it, you know, 80 to 90 percent of their portfolio has been, you know, in things like real estate and equities. And what I keep telling everybody is enjoy it while it lasts. I mean, at the end of the day, if you have 90% of your portfolio in stocks and bonds and 10% in gold, you really don't want the 10% to pay off and the 90% to, to not pay off. You know, uh, you, you, you should want gold to go to 800 and never come back. Because if that happens, the rest of your portfolio is probably doing pretty well and the world is continuing on to be a, a nice place. However, if what I think is going to happen comes to be, you're going to be very glad you had that 10 to 20 percent and you're probably going to wish you had a little bit more. Um, so I think it all depends on how you structured it to begin with, the reasons you got into it, the time frame over which you thought it was going to pay off, and um, you know, just an overall sound investment philosophy. Brent, I think those words were very, uh, very wise words. Uh, don't, don't sell your house and your children. Put plonk it all into precious metals, but it's an insurance policy and have a, a percentage in there. And I think when you come down to Australia, uh, our investors would be very pleased for you to just give those words of wisdom to them as to, you know, how do they structure things and how do they get educated? Sure. Any, sure. Any, I, I'd like to ask uh, one last question, that is, what's your top tip sure. for uh, our listeners today? And uh, what can they expect to hear from you when they're down in Australia, when you're down in Australia? Okay, I think the, the top tip that I would give people is just because you read it somewhere doesn't necessarily make it true. <laughs> Regardless of who said it or who's quoted in it. It doesn't matter if it's your mom, your dad, the mayor, the governor, or the president. Just because they said it doesn't make it true. Now, obviously, if your life experiences with this person has led you to believe, and they have a, they have a, a, a history with you that, that, that tells you that they're a trustful source and that you can rely on what they're saying, that goes a long way. But I would encourage everybody to check everything for themselves, you know, check it in more than one place, and just because people say it, this is for your own good, and it should be this way, and that, you know, if we don't do this, you know, really bad things are going to happen. I think you have to question their motivations and, and, and really think about it because I really had a life transformation over the last five years and that, that's probably uh, you know, one of the things I'd like to share with listeners is that um, you know, when you start questioning what you hear and you, you start looking at things critically regardless of who says it, you really start to learn and you really start to see things for what they really are and I think that you become a smarter person. Um, now, that doesn't mean that I have everything figured out. I certainly don't, and I learn something new every day. Uh, but I think I've learned how to learn better in the last five years than I learned in the previous 35 years of my life. Well, 
I hope that uh, you can bring some of those learnings with you to uh, the Gold Investment Symposium. Uh, Brent Johnson from Santiago Capital over in San Francisco, thanks for talking to us today. We'll see you down here in October. All right, great. I can't wait to get there.